Well, as regular viewers will be more than aware, Newsnight isn't ashamed to regurgitate, or more commonly, to visit for the very first time ancient news. If it's news, it's news to us. Tonight we surpass ourselves with analysis of events of the very dawn of time, before even the Antiques Roadshow had been invented. American scientists believe they've discovered something that happened a fraction of a second after the Big Bang some several billion years ago. In the world of cosmology, it's a very big deal indeed. Chris Lintott of the Sky at Night fame reports tonight for Newsnight. The universe began 13.8 billion years ago in a Big Bang. And scientists' imaginations can take us back almost to that point. But until now, testing those dreams with real evidence has proved impossible. In an unspectacular setting, remarkable news, and a day that many of these scientists thought would never come. A chance to test our theories of physics in the most extreme of conditions. I'm at the Royal Observatory Greenwich, the historical home of British astronomy and a place renowned for timekeeping. But even the astronomers here would be impressed if I told them we had evidence of something that happened a 10 million billion billion billionth of a second after the Big Bang. Today's discovery comes from a radio telescope at the South Pole, known as BICEP-2. The South Pole's a great place to do astronomy. It's desert dry, which allows BICEP to see the oldest light in the universe, the cosmic microwave background. And this is that cosmic microwave background, a picture of the universe as it was about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And you can see it's lumpy. There are dark bits which are cooler than the average, and there are bright bits that are hotter than the average. And all of that structure goes on to form the galaxies that we see around us today. To begin with, the universe was filled with a soup of particles, mainly electrons, and light scattered from one electron to another. But as the universe expanded, the electrons lost energy, and they're suddenly captured by atomic nuclei, which leaves the light free to stream right across the universe, reaching us here on Earth 13.8 billion years later. That light contains the distinctive imprint of a violent time in the universe's history. Just after the Big Bang, it seems the universe expanded almost instantaneously in a kind of cosmic inflation. Space itself would have rippled, sending what are known as gravitational waves spreading out across the universe. And it's the effect of those waves that BICEP has seen today. Inflation is an idea which has really solves a lot of problems, but finding evidence for it is hard. And this is really the first, uh, not direct evidence, but it's indirect evidence, which is, looks on the face of it quite powerful. Inflation changed our universe forever. It created the seeds from which the galaxies that we see around us formed, and it guaranteed that the part of the universe we can see is only a tiny, and some would say insignificant part of all there is. What we've seen today might well be the first signal of an event that happened a tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang, but which shaped the universe around us. If this result stands up, this will be a red letter day in the history of physics and something that will win many people many Nobel Prizes in the years to come. Well, Clement Pryke, co-leader of the BICEP2 collaboration, is in Boston. Here in London are Maggie Adderin Pocock, space scientist and co-presenter of The Sky at Night, and Hirana Paris, a reader in astronomy at UCL. Uh, let's come to you in, in Boston, if I may, uh, Mr. Pryke, first. Um, were you surprised by what you found? Yeah, we were somewhat surprised. So uh, previous... Uh, measurements had indicated indirectly that the signal should be a little smaller than the signal that we actually found. So that was surprising, although from a theoretical perspective, perhaps the signal is about the size that it would be expected to be. Uh, of course, it's also very surprising to go on, a, on a, you know, what some people might have characterized as a wild goose chase and actually find the goose. So yes, we were very surprised. <laughs> and it must be amazing. I mean, you're looking at evidence of something that happened nearly 14 billion years ago. What's that like? Well, you see, that's nothing to us because we've been <laughs> studying the microwave background for years, right? So uh, we've been looking back to the 400,000 year epoch. Uh, uh, you know, that, that's been my career. 
But this, today's discovery is special because it's actually looking at an imprint at that 400,000 year uh, uh, epoch, which comes from the first tiny, tiny fraction of a second after the beginning. So we're essentially seeing uh, 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 gravitational waves from that first moment of creation written on the, the sky at 400,000 years. Did you, were you following a hunch here? I mean, did you find that there was opposition to your pursuing this line of research? Because it must have been phenomenally expensive. <laughs> well, actually, our, our experiment is not terribly expensive by the standards of modern physics research. I mean, we're talking uh, t a couple, maybe 10, 20 million dollars. It's a small telescope, actually. It's a highly targeted experiment. So we built our experiment specifically to look for this particular uh, 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 observational signature and nothing else. So that allowed it to be, uh, you know, uh, only modestly expensive. Did you find it difficult to get backing? Well, uh, you know, the, uh, we are funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation, and they actually fund a number of telescopes, uh, s you know, after the same goal as us. Uh, they differ in details, but that basically after the same goal. So that is the way that they've decided to go, uh, you know, funding, funding a, a number of smaller experiments. The European Space Agency actually has right now the Planck Space Mission, which is a very expensive mission, uh, which is, uh, go, you know, going after the same thing amongst other things. That, that's a more generalized experiment. Now, we've got a couple of your colleagues here in the studio in London, one of, one of whom at least is involved. You're both involved in the Planck project. Just me. Just, Just you. Yes. You're involved in it. Um, exciting day, isn't it? It is an amazing day. This buzz has been building for a few days. There were all these rumors on the internet and people were discussing what could come. But I think the, the news that we got today exceeded certainly my expectations. The level of the signal was very high. Uh, this was unexpected because, like he said, the, the Planck collaboration had set this slightly lower limit, and that's very interesting. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, the way that their experiment actually worked and the level of uh, the very low noise they were able to achieve with that in order to detect this signal, I think is an incredible achievement. Um, Maggie, is there anything you would like to ask Clement in Boston about... about how can, test him on whether he's actually got it right. <laughs> oh, is he? Gosh, I wasn't expecting that. Um, ah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, so, well, Clement, I'm trying to think. Ah, so how long have you gathered this data for? Because um, is it a sort of a recent occurrence or uh, have you got sort of um, quite a bit of data? Because uh, before you, uh, people publish anything, you want to have a bit of a robustness behind you. How much data have you got and how much are you holding in reserve? <laughs> So the data that we announced uh, today was taken between 2010 and 2012. So the last of that data was taken more than a year ago. And the reason that it's taken us a while to, to, to finalize the result and put it out is precisely because the result was so unexpected that we needed to check everything and really uh, drill into every possible, slice and dice the data in every possible way to try and make sure that you know, we weren't making a mistake, that there wasn't contamination either from the experiment or from sources on the ground or even from foreground emission from our own galaxy. But we're pretty sure and uh, we set everything out in the papers that we submitted today and uh, you know, people can judge for themselves. Okay, so supposing he's right, what's the significance? Let's, let's assume. <laughs> I will be the last to know and so will many, well, apart from some of our viewers, I suppose. But um, let's, let's assume that this is all as it appears. This okay. is a sensational discovery. Why does it matter? Yeah. What we're looking at, uh, there are two discoveries here. Um, the first one, I'll, I'll talk about gravitational waves, or, 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 as I like to describe them, the elusive gravitational wave. So Einstein predicted them in um, uh, uh, 1916. We've waited 100 years. Lots of other things that Einstein uh, predicted in his general theory of relativity, uh, gravitational lensings, other things like that, have been proved and verified. But gravitational waves was one of the elusive things that we didn't actually have uh, any evidence to support. So just the fact that we've got that is another tick in the box for that theory. Um, and then also um, this uh, cosmic expansion. Um, we have known, as you said in, in your start, we've known about the Big Bang for many, many years now. We've seen the evidence to support it. But it's what happened at the very start of the Big Bang. When you go for some, something 
unbelievably tiny, the very uh, nugget of the universe, to something of, a, of the size of a bat of marble. There seems to be some glitches in that, things that didn't quite stand up with the theory. And so um, uh, people made suggestions in, sort of, uh, in the 80s. They came up with suggestions of what happened, and they came up with this cosmic expansion. So in a very, very tiny time, there was a massive expansion. Now, when you get that, you get these gravitational waves produced, and that's what we're looking at the remnants of now. But that, um, that expansion was the blueprint for the universe we live in today. So the terms and conditions at that point dictate the universe we live in today. Now, there are some people talking about how this provides a hint to the theory of everything. Mm -hmm. That's right. Can you explain, just in lay layman's terms, what that means? Okay, so this process of inflation that's been discussed here actually acted as the origin of all the stuff that we see in the universe today. All the galaxies, clusters of galaxies, planets, everything came from tiny little ripples in space in the very early times. And this is a direct hint of that time and of that physics. So we have two theories. One is uh, the um, Einstein's general relativity, the theory of gravity. There's another pillar of modern physics, which is quantum mechanics. Actually, these two theories by themselves are inconsistent, and they have to be unified in a broader theory, a theory of quantum gravity. Now, you probably heard of string theory. That's a candidate for that. If we have gravitational waves at the, the level that they've detected today, it actually makes the physics at this really, really early time sensitive to a theory of quantum gravity. I think this could be a really tremendous leap in physics, not just in cosmology, but if this discovery pans out, it could point to quite a, a significant breakthrough in physics. Funny for those of us in the tawdry old business of news. I mean, this really is news, isn't it? This is news. <laughs> Having a grand theory of everything is what we've dreamed of. This is what it's about. <laughs> Let me just talk to you in Boston just very briefly. I mean, are you in line... Do you hope for a Nobel Prize for this? <laughs> oh, we've been deliberately uh, suppressing all talk of, uh, of that, but uh, I've heard others mentioning it. <laughs> well, you're a very <laughs> modest man. Congratulations. Thank you very much, all of you.